Perfect. Hello, everyone, and welcome to one of our United States and Canada virtual community meetups. My name is Olivia, and I am a community programs specialist on our community team here at Elastic. Today, we are joined by Patrick Harris and Dr. Paul Hoffman um, as they dive into real-time analytics platform, massive scale, advanced analytics, aviation use cases. So with that, I'll turn it over to you both. Yep. Th thank you, Olivia, for that introduction. You know, I'm Patrick and Paul's online here with me. I'm going to brief the slide deck and Paul's going to answer the questions after I get done with the slide deck. I'll try to talk, you know, efficiently through it so that we have plenty of time for questions afterward. Thanks. But of course, we have to start out with the appropriate attribution to Elastic itself. In my mind, it's an incredible ecosystem that's been developed over not quite 10 years when I first encountered it. Uh, and it, it truly is an incredible ecosystem that uh, has been developed to support all of our work across the world. I really appreciate it. My particular intersection started with Jason Getz, who's no longer with Elastic, I understand, but he, I met him in 2016 when I was working on an independent contract, uh, Air Force contract. And then later I was supported by Rich, uh, who was an initial member, maybe still is a member of the data mining uh, group. When I worked a contract with the director and chief engineer and actually the whole, the whole facility uh, in an advanced analytics uh, analysis of basically the entire design of the CH-47 and all the data associated with it. And then more recently, I uh, interacted with uh, Dave Erickson, Shankar Subramani, and, and Steve Weiss in an architectural review. But of course, I have to appreciate the community managers because, and business development, and the sales cycle, because of course, they're the ones that uh, continually get us in front of the, the groups and as appropriate at the you know, with the proper uh, timing for all of us. So thanks, Olivia. Uh, and this is just a brief ex uh, statement about Elasticsearch is, to me, an incredibly uh, cool architecture. And the group itself uh, has provided a scalable to petabytes, push efficient architecture that's easy to manage and like many other distributed infrastructures. And of course, the Elasticsearch itself is the index. The query server is Kibana and the log stash is the IO layer. And that's just simple remarks about complex systems because they're all distributed and scalable. That's, it's hard to build scalable systems. And they provided all sorts of other utilities and make it easy to operate these uh, distributed infrastructures and in enterprises, including the appropriate security and users roles and the enormously efficient and good community ecosystem. So that's why I use Elasticsearch. Uh, but it's not the only tool that I use because I have a couple of other friends in the world, including Paul, so the architecture is a little bit different where we take real-time feeds, in this case from AHM, Airplane Health Management. DFDR stands for Digital Flight Data Recorder Data a feed, a, you know, a streaming feed we generate and we push it into a large, large compressed graph engine that can find similar patterns across all the data that we insert. And I'll talk more about that later. And then we push the results out to Elasticsearch. And then of course, because Elasticsearch has such a nice ecosystem, we can immediately visualize and analyze and validate the findings of the previous steps. And this is the, the money shot that you know businesses are interested in. And these figures come from 28, 2019, the, 
so-called normal year before COVID occurred. And I rounded down, it's a little bit more than 10% of the US GDP. And across the world, that's generally the factor of merit in all the other countries. Uh, aviation is a key, uh, you know, a key to many economies and all the travel associated with it and all the support across the whole world to get things to work every day. And the estimate for aviation analytics alone is 15% of that. And for a small company, 1% captures uh, 3.2 billion capture. But uh, that that's a conservative estimate. I'm just giving that as an example. Because, you know, if you consider the design of the airplane and all the operational stuff and all the flight dynamics and all the weather in the world, there's lots of data to correlate against. It's amazingly, it, it's very difficult altogether. There's more than 40 data sources that I've interacted with in my life to, to correlate everything that you might need to correlate against. And the correlation, of course, is against, you know, structured data, lots of unstructured data, diagrams, sensor data. By sensor data, I need mean flight data recorder data for commercial. DOD might uh, also involve some other things, but I'm not gonna talk about that here. Uh, and this list of aviation use cases, I just put six. Originally, there's more than a dozen here, but far too complicated to even look at at that point. So these six are like umbrella statements of what people are most interested in, which is uh, what they call airplane health and performance. Because of course, we wanna operate it efficiently and, and low, low cost so that people can derive revenue. And the worst case is the airplane on the ground situation, which disrupts the plan and cost considerable amount to commercial and DOD operational. And then we have all the designs from all the elements in aviation, quite complex and all sorts of dimensions. Today, we're just gonna briefly look at engine prognostics and diagnostics uh, because engines are a cost driver along with the fuel management systems because the Fuel is measured in gallons per minute for engine. So although we might complain about the current gas price for our car, the aviation groups are, you know, gallons per minute. Uh, and then if you correlate everything else, which are the logbook and faults and maintenance event, to cross correlate everything, it's hard, but it's not impossible to do. <laughs> and another key element, in all of this is safety. I just wanted to touch briefly on that because safety is like the number one uh, priority of all systems. Aviation is one of those complex domains where we require safety. Uh, and the NTSB, National Transportation Safety Board, has listed numerous investigative accident reports. And if I've managed to sit and listen and review safety investigations in my past. And it's an incredible team that comes together to do that. Uh, you know, the OEM parties and everybody else that's associated with a design. It's really difficult, but I, I suggest that uh, if you wanted to know more, click on this particular one or different one. This incident occurred in 2019. Atlas Air was a cargo flight, Amazon was flying to Texas that didn't quite make the airport. And this one's a different one from Canada. Uh, again, they have their equivalent of the National Transportation Board. And this is, uh, this is just what normally people see in a flight investigation, which is the flight dynamics that occurred across the significant variables or parameters. And the, then in the descriptive elements of the report, it discusses why the plane didn't actually make the runway. But it's, uh, you know, one thing that's not uh, easy is when people try to visually correlate and diagnose problems. 
it's really difficult for humans although the safety investigators can do it because they're the experts, it's very difficult for anybody else to even determine whether any particular flight is normal or not, visually. I mean, but lots of systems are built like that. Uh, human visual acuity is pretty good, so people visually correlate things all the time, but it's, you know, you need a lot of expertise to do that. So instead of doing that along the time frame that Paul and I have known each other and previously when I worked in some other spots, in particular at Bell Labs, telecom uh, stuff and Aspen Tech process control of large industrial sites, uh, looking at all the parameters in some summary format gives you some insight. So this is just merely a demonstration of 26 parameters associated with aviation flights, just to make it amenable for review in, a, in this uh, format. Altogether, the FAA, I think, requires 125 parameters to be present in the flight data recorder. And again, I just chose the ones associated with engines because it's somewhat amenable for understanding. So the parameter set on the uh, enumerated on the left are the engine, engine gas temperature, fuel flow, compressor speed, con control targets, tur turbine speed, power level angle, which is essentially the gas pedal. Let's see, and uh, and engine vibration and and uh, flight, and so on. The anyway, in the middle is just this. Uh, conceptual basis for mapping, correlating two parameters together to generate a, a correlation. And on the right is uh, correlation squares, all those possible parameters correlated together. And it basically summarizes the whole flight uh, characteristics. And it's easy to see that there might not be something normal in this particular thing on the, on the right. I'll talk about that in a bit. And Paul made this nice chart for me one day because uh, <laughs> he, he's always thinking about a better way of presenting things. And basically the scheme is take all the historical data from all the flights of all the planes of similar designs, everything, not just the sensor data, but the text data and all the alerts, faults, everything. And if you can do that and apply what I would like to say the, you know, really, there's probably hundreds of charts that look like this. <laughs> Paul made this one a few years back. You know, deep learning, machine learning, people talk about this all the time, but those matrices that we're discussing amount to millions and millions of patterns associated with either okay systems, normal, degraded, or failed. So the question is, how do you actually find the uh, what you need to know to fix it as fast as you can. And there is a method not, uh, not discussed here where I can show continuous degradation of any system on board months in advance of fail. But most people can't do that, most be, mostly because of tradition and thinking. So here's the kind of an expanded set where the original uh, squares on the left in a large format, and then the eight following flights. And a human, you know, the orientation is the same, the same parameters along the axis. Uh, this particular metric space is uh, symmetrical, so but some metric spaces are non-symmetrical, so we have the same square. But across time, you can see how it changes until the bottom right where it's the AOG result, airplane on the ground. That costs, costs one to 5K per minute for a commercial air aviation group. Uh, anyway, and again, visually humans can pick that out, but machine learning groups can also, if properly assessed, can uh, can actually figure out things uh, without visual, uh, without visualizing it. But in Elasticsearch, we can, you know, validate the findings. 
So here's a case where, again, we take a particular flight that's almost normal. But just because of my experience in this domain, I can tell you it's not a normal flight. It's burning more fuel than is necessary. And again, we're using Elasticsearch. All the data from all the flights in my work always get pushed to Elasticsearch because it can store gig gigabytes, petabytes. No problem. You can search anything anywhere. The problem is finding where the anomalies are and that this other method is a way to do that. And here's an example of a poor performing flight right before the AOG uh, state occurs. And you can see it's visually quite a bit different, both in the, the square matrix form and also time domain. And the little square to the right, lower right, is a particular electrical device, like maybe a radio that's toggling on and off consistently every second. And you can, can kind of imagine that that might be annoying to the pilots and co-pilots as they're trying to, uh, you know, do a landing. If you have intermittent, intermittent communication path on a radio, it's not good from a safety viewpoint. Uh, Elasticsearch is quite, uh, like I say, quite unique, has all sorts of ways of showing visualizations and in this case, it's, uh, anyway, N1T is the turbine control target conditioned on the other two parameters, uh, N2, 3, and N2, 4, which is the turbine speed of the jet engine spool. It was the third and fourth engine that had some, you know, an air state during the descent in the previous slide. So a short uh, excursion in math, and although like noting the elk aggregate functions here, uh, it's very commonplace in all industries to use linear analysis, that is common first order statistics, to calculate f of x, t on some constant, and develop the mean variance and covariance. But unfortunately, all of those elements are what is known in mathematics as linear analysis. It just happens in this case to be, you know, I'm showing it in, in airplane health management, but it really applies to all systems. Because not quite all systems, but all naturally occurring systems and complex systems, because really all the important uh, enterprises that we have everything's complex and nonlinear. So what's expressed on the bottom is what my team does, which is express in both the time and frequency domain, nonlinear metric spaces in a hyperdimensional view of all the data so that you can actually see uh, more insight than you would otherwise be able to see. And this is a visual representation of what I just said, you know, mathematical form, which is statistics is basically shows you linear uh, phenomena and all nonlinear phenomena is basically shows zero. You can't see it at all, which is unfortunate because there's lots of domains where you absolutely require it. And so all the things below are examples of nonlinear behavior. Control systems often use sine waves to synchronize parameters. And communication, telecom, you know, cell phones, all that, over on the right, those are representative of good communication channels. But there's some other examples in between where things are not working in telecom world either. And knowing that is essential to you know, discovering root cause. And thankfully to Paul again, recognizing his sharing of his knowledge. He taught me how to better assess systems in a multi-dimensional fashion. So my other primary colleague is this fellow named Dr. Alan Wagner. He's a famous distributing computer professor who helps Cisco and Google both to speed up and provide more reliable streaming service for them. And uh, anyway, you know, this slide deck will be posted, has been posted various places and available here. So you can click on the link 
but basically what Alan has generated is a complex parallel processing system graph that can be compiled on a laptop and uh, deployed with equal ease on clusters, small, large, medium, <laughs> or vice versa, supercomputers without recompiling and running large graphs. And he did something particularly interesting in that he, he wrote his own scheduler that controls all the threads within the system doing parallel processing. That's kind of the Achilles heels of all systems on earth, computer systems. Threads are, you know, superficially parallel, but if you actually look at what's going on, the OS owns the threads and it arbitrarily, arbitrarily chooses the next one. But suppose you have an infrastructure that can actually schedule and coordinate all those threads. That's what Alan Wagner's system does. So I'm not going to click on the window to the left, but again, when you access it on the web later, you can click on the window on the left. I'm concerned that if I do that, I'll lose this, this particular presentation. But uh, Alan Wagner's uh, initial work in the 2010 era was to uh, produce this particular demonstration, which is correlating all the stocks in the stock market in a tenth of a second, a high frequency trading uh, data flow. And it's good for a lot of use cases that are, you know, enumerated here for, you know, better insight, portfolio management, risk, and fraud. And so when you access this online, you can click on that and see it, see that the system actually works. And on another day, you know, I can demonstrate uh, this same thing for, uh, turns out the same similarity, nonlinear similarity metric spaces work as well for stocks as it does for aviation, as it does for genetics. But for the aviation team, it's, you know, this core team of Alan, my friend Greg Arnold, who has uh, uh, worked with me at Boeing, and then later, and even to this day, supports my activities in this uh, team, the, the RTAP team, Paul and myself, and then the associates team, which is uh, Dr. Amy Hoover, the CWU aviation safety human factors expert. And she owns her own uh, small private plane flying instructor group called Canyon Flying. And my professor Bayhill, who's a, a engineering professor emeritus, uh, he, anyway, his he's got four degrees. His professor had 12 degrees. He, he has an MD degree computer science, double E control systems. Anyway, and uh, before I met him, my colleague Kimberly Kaiser met him at CMU. She has, uh, she worked at Boeing, now retired in a airplane health management. And she also has a degree in neurophysiology from CMU where she met Terry Bayhill uh, and Terry was working with, at the time, Pittsburgh Pirates and the famous Red Sox player, Ted Williams. I got to meet Ted one day. That was a fun event. Uh, Tom Marsh, uh, uh, you can look him up. He's a specialist in text analytics. Paul introduced me to Tom in the past. Saul Cates is a relatively new uh, fellow in my circle. But he's absolutely uh, central to all cybersecurity interests. You know, no matter who you happen to use, it, cybersecurity has to be in play at all times in the modern environment due to the convergence of all the technology into the realm of enterprises. It's not at all certain at, on any one day what's secure and what's not, in my mind. Now, we can debate about that later. And Sue Schmidt is a, a long-term colleague. Uh, when she graduated, she started out in, in telco at the same time I did. But she actually, uh, uh, you know, developed a, a key person in a startup of something they called CLEX, Competitive Local Exchange Carrier in Seattle and 
expanded into Alaska. So she's uh, she's been helping in those domains, telco and fintech, because she's got expertise in both of those. And then there's lots of people that are quiet uh, due to NDA. And together, the team over the years has literally uh, provided growth to large enterprises to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars per year. <laughs> and that uh, that statement is uh, publicly acknowledged by those participants in some other places I can give you access to. So that's it. Uh, this bottom of the presentation just has a link back to this presentation that's been posted in LinkedIn, my LinkedIn profile, the post associated with this event this morning. That's it. Uh, you're up uh, for questions, Paul. Thanks. Thank you, Patrick. Doesn't look like any questions have come in. Um, may have to keep an eye after this yep. presentation goes live. Um, we can give it a, a couple more uh, seconds or so, but I just want to say thank you uh, both for presenting. Um, again, if anyone does have questions, uh, Patrick has his contact information. We'll include a link to this specific slide deck um, in the description of YouTube and uh feel free to reach out um patrick paul any any thoughts from your end so paul do you want to make any comments since we have i guess i talked fairly fast here I may have yeah, no, I'm, I'm up here it's open for questions all right the basic idea is that everything in the world is a graph and uh, and how do you come to a graph? A graph represents similarities, distances between objects. And and what we use here is uh, nonlinear relationships between those objects that change over time, and that is quite quite uh, mind blowing, innovative, and uh, needs enormous compute power. That's what we can say to that. Can they? Can they, can anybody ask, or do they have to? How do we get questions? Do people ask, or how do the questions come in? Would I think on uh, YouTube chat, um, but doesn't look like any have come through just yet. So, so, so oh, it's I, not the chat that we see here, right? No, no. Okay. I, I think what happens is they start streaming it, and then it gets consumed, and then people see it, and later they'll comment. Yep, yep, exactly. It doesn't look like any live attendees have any questions at the moment. And, and yeah. uh, that's just because there's, you know, millions of uh, YouTubers <laughs> and Elasticsearch users in the world. Everybody's busy, probably. Yeah, yeah that is, you, you don't get, I mean, this is the, the good news and the bad news. The good news is it's asynchronous. Anybody can watch it uh, when you she wants it, but on the other hand, uh, it's it's tough to do a, a live Q and A. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, um, if anyone watching this uh, has questions, um, feel free to reach out, post in the comments. Um, but other than that, can you send me the link, Olivia? What's the link? Yeah, I will send you the link after uh, we wrap up the live stream. And then I can I can monitor it once in a while. Yep. And answer questions that might come up. Yeah, you know, really, this is just, a, uh, in a way, a marketing study. And later, when participants show up for questions, we can rebrief details to them. Mm -hmm. okay. now, yeah. it, it's, it's possibly quite possible, Paul, that I didn't spend sufficient time uh, advertising properly on our behalf. You mean now in the presentation or before? Oh, no, prior to this uh, event. Well, that's okay. Yeah. Yep. So it is a uh, quite esoteric topic in general, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, in the like uh, Olivia's uh, has discussed, uh, we'll be talking in front of the European group uh, shortly. You know, yeah. in a, a couple of weeks, and maybe more interest will be generated by then. We'll see. Okay. I, I did a similar presentation at one point, actually, to, to uh, Airbus, as you know. But um, 
you know, what happens is, and what I see in general, and basically we saw that at Boeing too, you remember, it takes a moment for engineers to wrap their head around it. They are not data scientists, they are not necessarily physicists or mathematicians. And so uh, to look at things that way, which which is a quite oh. unusual point of view, is not, it, you have to get accustomed to it if you're an aviation engineer, I guess. Yeah, but there there are at least two parties inside of Boeing, maybe three that are anxious for me to get, for us, the team to get started. So yeah. they're probably just busy with whatever they're doing on a normal day. Perfect. Yeah. So I, I we're still live. So let's um, any any final thoughts you want to say to the people still viewing? Uh, thank you very much for watching this uh, later in your day, <laughs> and uh, in the future, please contact us for any more detailed questions or insights about this particular uh, team and infrastructure. Perfect. Well, thank Bye. you both. And thank you everyone for tuning in. And if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank Bye. you, Olivia, for hosting us. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Olivia, for your time today.